I've seen the film, The King of the Clown. Two, three, four, yeah. Did you like it? Mm -hmm. Great film. This, believe it or not, became the biggest box office success in Korean history, which is kind of interesting given that it has this queer theme, mm -hmm. which is not incidental to the film, it's the whole center of the film. And it's about two characters um, who are in this Nam Sadam troupe. And the older man is in love with the younger man who plays the, the women's roles. Now, from the film, it's not quite clear whether the younger male identifies as a woman or just as a feminine male. But uh, certainly, because of his femininity and his beauty, uh, he's hit on by all the men who come to see uh, them act. And one of the other older men in that <coughs> troupe falls in love with him too, and there's this whole scene of jealous rage, uh, where the older man, uh, who is his best friend and is in, in love with him, uh, sort of strikes this other guy who's his rival, and so they have to run away. And so they run away to Seoul, the capital, and they end up uh, performing for the king, and the king falls in love with the younger uh, feminine male. And so there's this really interesting, uh, rather strange love triangle. Uh, with the king and the older actor and the younger actor. Uh, and when it came out in late 2005, I think no one could have predicted that it would become the biggest bounce off of success in Korean film history. Here's a, a, a promo poster for the film. So you can see um, the character Jung Sang is the older actor. Uh, played by Gamu Seong, and then Gong Gil, who is the younger feminine actor, um, who's played by uh, Lee Jun Ki, and then the king, Yong Sun, is played by Jung, uh, Jin Wong, um, and it was in movie theaters from late 2005 to early 2007, and became a runaway hit, and now everyone in Korea knows about the Nam Sadam tradition, and this very interesting proto transgender homoerotic uh, aspect to it. So there are two other aspects of Korean tradition that are interesting. There's a tradition of the boy wives. Now, uh, Gary Liu refers to this uh, very briefly, in just a few paragraphs, but he says that there's evidence that in many Korean villages in pre-modern times, older men would actually take teenage boys as their wives, and they would be officially recognized as couples. It's not quite clear from reading the book or from uh, the documentary evidence whether when these boys grew up and became adults, whether the relationship ended, which is the way it was in Greece, in ancient Athens, uh, the older man would sort of mentor the younger man. Um, and when the younger man, who was a teenager, became an adult around the age of 21 or 22, that's when the relationship was supposed to, the sexual part of the relationship was supposed to end, and then the younger man himself became a mentor in a homoerotic relationship with uh, a teenage boy. Now, I should add, you know, that in Greek society, in Athenian society, you were required, you were expected to marry heterosexually and have children. So this uh, relationship of idea between the older man and the younger man took place in the context of patriarchal society. So it's important to recognize that um, homoerotic relationships uh, are not necessarily completely incompatible, oddly enough, with patriarchal social structures. Um, this is a picture of the Mudang. Now, the Mudang tradition, I think, is really fascinating. It's uh, the tradition that Koreans carried down, uh, down into the Korean Peninsula with them when they migrated from eastern Siberia. And the native indigenous peoples of eastern Siberia, Chukchi, for example, <coughs> are cousins of the Inuit, Eskimos, the Inuit of Alaska and North America. And uh, in the Chukchi tradition, just like the Mudang tradition in Korea, uh, the shaman, the Mudang, uh, was always a woman, but not necessarily a female. It was a woman-centered spiritual culture in which some males participated as women. Now, 
What is not entirely clear from the documentary evidence, because this is very much a case of history, is whether or not those male Mudam, or Aksu Mudam, also lived as women, uh, if they were transgendered women, as we would say today, or whether they were just playing a role in the shamanic rites and rituals, and then lived as men outside the context of that shamanic tradition. Um, we don't really know. I suspect that at least some of them must have lived as women. Um, but there's very little left of the Mudang tradition. There are still Mudang in Korea, and people see them, but it's all considered a little bit, um, how would I put this? It's considered a little bit lower class and a little bit looked down upon. We like seeing a, you know, a gypsy fortune teller or something like that. But um, when you build a new house, you're supposed to call on the Mudang to do the sacred good ritual, which is to banish the uh, bad spirits and call down the good spirits. And they're particularly important when you think your house is haunted, has demons or other creatures in it, then you have to call the local Muda uh, to rid yourself from the house of uh, demons. And this is a little image of painting of a Mudang performing the ritual and practicing. Hi, can I ask? Sure. So? Um, from what I know, uh, actually, I, Mudang is actually considered a different sex, you know? Than, and you know, most Mudangs are, and I'm not a female people. And from what I've read, um, you know, because of you know, <coughs> Japanese colonization, Patriarchy and all this stuff, um, you know, it, like before modern times, a lot of uh, anatomically female born Mudans would also dress as men and live their lives as men. So it was a um, cross gender um, either side, either way. Um, and I also, from what I read, um, it's only anatomically female Mudans um, who can be the head shaman. And on a and kind of female, um, Mudans can only become persistent shamans. Um, the Mudang tradition, as I say, is part of the Altaic culture, which is the oldest element in Korean culture. Um, the Sinicization of Korea, the introduction of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism, resulted in a significant change in Korean religious tradition. Um, and in 1392, there was a social revolution that was engineered by the first king of the last dynasty, the Yi dynasty, the Joseon dynasty. Uh, he had Chinese-influenced Neo-Confucian scholars as advisors, and they decided to redraw Korean society along Chinese lines. Korean culture was traditionally a matrilineal, not matriarchal, but matrilineal society in which uh, wealth and property descended through the mother's line rather than the father's line. Um, and as I say, the shamanic culture reflected that <coughs> as the woman's center. Uh, when the Neo-Confucian Revolution uh, was, uh, uh, was engineered in 1392, uh, property then went down, passed through the male line, and society was redrawn along patriarchal Chinese lines and the status of women was radically downgraded. Uh, so that was the beginning of the decline in the Mudang culture because it no longer fit into the new Chinese society that was people yeah. out of this country. Yeah, and I think we need to just be careful about using women because I think you're really talking about females. Yeah. Know, because Mudangs weren't seen as the category of women, you know, traditionally. They were, you know, like both, both men and female Mudangs were um, so, um, then of course by the 19th century you had Christian missionaries, and by the 20th century, uh, communism in the north, um, capitalism in the south, and the impact of all these influences was the erosion of the Mudang culture. Uh, interestingly enough, a few years ago, I actually saw a Mudang here in New York, uh, who came to uh, perform, I guess is the word, Usage of the word 
at Lincoln Center, the Lincoln Center Festival had this sort of um, happening, which was kind of halfway between a performance and a ritual ceremony. And she performs a very, well, to our minds, unusual and strange um, rituals and rites. It was really quite fascinating. Um, I think talking about Mudong is interesting, though, because most pre-modern cultures, whether Eastern or Western, that were not primarily monotheistic in orientation, like Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, um, polytheistic cultures, as well as those that were birth-centered uh, and shamanic, uh, tended to be friendlier, both more woman-friendly and more queer-friendly than the monotheistic cultures that emerged uh, in the Middle East. Um, South Asia and Southeast Asia, once again, there is much less on both of these that I could find than on East Asian culture reflecting that bias, but I did find some. Now, the Hitra and the Katui are two interesting examples. The Hitra in India um, are part of an ancient tradition of eunuchs who undergo a ritual castration and dedicate themselves to a uh, goddess to serve in the temples um, dedicated uh, to that goddess. Uh, the Katui, Katui is a term that's sometimes translated as lady woman, uh, in Thailand, and it's more of a general term for a male to female a transgender person or a transgender woman. It doesn't necessarily have the same uh, religious, religious or spiritual connotations as Hitra. Um, the interesting thing about the Hitra is that even though they're part of an ancient religious tradition, they have really fallen to a low estate in contemporary India. They're very much looked down upon. Um, first of all, what they do is they'll go to weddings or the equivalent of baptisms and bless uh, a baby or a married couple if you give them money. But if you don't, they'll curse you. And so it's a kind of an extortion act. <laughs> kind of like a religious spiritual extortion act. And so either pay me or I'll curse you. Uh, and so they're kind of disliked and resented for that reason alone. Um, they don't necessarily make enough money off of those, uh, performing those little ceremonies uh, to live. So many, if not most of them, are forced into sex work. Some of, them, some of them actively choose it, but most of them are forced into it because of discrimination and poverty. Many of them come from the Dalit class, the, uh, the so-called untouchable class or caste. Um, not all, but some of them. And once they undergo the ritual castration and live as hijra, they're considered Dalit or untouchable, uh, whether or not that was their actual caste origin. Now, of course, caste is illegal in India. It has, uh, was abolished officially in 1947, but a lot of Indians are still extremely conscious of caste and caste origin, so it tends to follow you around whether or not you want to identify with a particular uh, caste of origin. There was a film, a documentary about Hitra that I saw at New Fast a few years ago. It was uh, quite fascinating and rather sad. Most of the Hitra, as they say, are forced into sex work, and many of them um, get involved with fairly abusive relations and abusive comments. So even though, even though in theory, uh, they're uh, performing some sort of religious or spiritual function, in practice, they're really pretty much looked down upon and face a lot of discrimination in Indian society. How many of you have seen the film Beautiful Boxer? Isn't it a great film? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? We screened that film. Um, what was it? We screened that film like the same time right? Yeah. And it tells the story of a famous Thai kicks kickboxer who was transgender. And it was a big hit. It's uh, really a wonderful film. You should see it if you haven't. Uh, about 
uh, this uh, tank uh, 